Hi everybody, I'm Debbie Atek. I'm a Bering Straits Native Corporation shareholder and a portfolio specialist for Skyview Investment Advisors. Welcome to this series of interviews that I've been doing to explore the opportunities and challenges for economic development in Alaska, primarily for the Alaska Native Corporations. Please make sure to watch through to the end for an important disclaimer. In this series, we've been talking about regional and village corporations and what they can do to generate revenue as well as other benefits for shareholders. But what about the shareholders themselves? How can individuals get good, well-paying jobs? Kevin Short is a Bethel Native Corporation and Chalista shareholder and has retired from the U.S. Army after a 20-year career. While defending our country, he also gained extensive experience in construction. He has been a project manager, superintendent, and quality control manager for Alaska Native Corporation subsidiaries in Hawaii, the South Pacific, and Alaska, and has had responsibility for over $80 million in military projects. Kevin currently works for NAN Inc. in the Marshall Islands, where he is now. Welcome, Kevin, and thank you for your service. Oh, thank you, Debbie. It's good to be here. Really, it's, it's awesome that we were able to work out this time. If people are not aware of where the Marshall Islands relative to the Alaska time zone, you are 20 hours ahead of us. So it's Correct. Thursday at 5 p.m., 5.08. Yes, right? baby. Yeah, yes. So it's, uh, it's dinner time for me and um, on Thursday. So That's crazy. Well, <laughs> I'm so glad that we uh, were able to connect over LinkedIn and uh, we started a conversation there about uh, ANCs and, um, and some of the different types of federal contracts that uh, ANCs have become involved in. One of the things that I noticed in your background is that you were the ANC board member rep for the Alaska Association of General Contractors. That's something that I don't really know anything about. Can you tell me um, what the significance of that was and what you uh, got out of that experience? Yeah, I participated in the AJC for Alaska, Alaska General Contractors. Um, I try to participate as much as I can, uh, meetings. Um, there was an opening for the ANC board member on the um, Construction Industry Progress Fund, which is a state Alaska funded program to promote the construction industry within Alaska, mainly to get the young people into the construction industry. So uh, I, I applied for it. I applied for it and I, I got accepted as a director on the um, CIPF board Okay. Um, for, for the AGC. Okay. And, um, so and, that's actually a, a perfect segue into what I really wanted to talk about today. And that is uh, the experience that you've had in trying to bring in young shareholders into um, particularly into the subsidiaries of the ANCs that have these federal contracting jobs, like construction, which seems like a great, it could be a great way to bring shareholders in and um, increase um, employment rates, right, for Alaska Natives and um, shareholders. Can you just talk about what your experience was working uh, maybe in that role, or maybe that's not where you did it, maybe you did it someplace else? Uh -huh. I kind of work I, uh, as a CIPF director. Um, I I also was heavily involved with the Chalista Workforce Development Program, okay. um, uh, promoting um, shareholder hire and shareholder development with Bre Brenda Vaccaro. Um, oh, okay. She ran the she ran the program at Chalista. So it kind of going kind of worked together because um, uh -huh. CIPF mainly. Did a lot of promotions. They promoted trades, union, and um, joining the unions, um, internship programs like Excel, that's okay. generally for high school students. Okay. Um, so it, it kind of bled together, which was really good. So, but on the shareholder hire, Chalista really had a really good shareholder hire um, outreach program. They worked good with Excel, uh, Alaska partnership for um, Alaska, Alaska Workforce Partnership Development Program also. And Excel is not Excel, the, the Microsoft Word Office program. No, it's E-X-C-L-C-E-L. -E and okay. it's, a, it's a state funded program, also a federally funded program. And it's mainly for younger high school age um, youth to get 
um, exposure either in construction, administrative, um, like Chilist had different business lines, the different business lines within uh, ANC. Okay, so and you in particular, you worked for a subsidiary, um, Ballista? Yeah, I work, I work for Ballista. Okay, I work so for is that Bryce. one that would take in um, people who had gone through Excel and then would they enter into like an apprenticeship program to get into a trade union? Because I know um, that's a big part of the challenge, right? Is yeah. getting people through, through into the unions or do you join as an apprentice? Can you walk those of us who are not, don't have construction sure. backgrounds through what the challenges are for our younger shareholders? And I guess at this point, honestly, it's mostly descendants. Um, and people who have been gifted shares that might have the opportunity to go into a trade, but what do they need to know about unions and how to um, work with the yeah. system? So Excel, what it did was introduce them into the, I'll use construction because that's what I do into the construction industry. And then sometimes it led into a full internship program for the summer and they actually got paid like 20 bucks an hour. So it was actually pretty good. And they work on projects for the whole summer. And we try to get um, young folks that are going to college and engineer programs in the construction industry. Um, also, we promoted the trades. Um, right. Which it could be electrician, equipment operators, plumbers, um, carpenters, uh, a wide variety of trades, iron workers. And... Um, through Excel and Alaska Workforce Development Programs, um, there's a lot of open recruitment to get shareholder hire um, in share, shareholders into the unions, um, which is a challenge because there's so many opportunities, but a lot of shareholders um, don't take advantage of it because they don't want to leave home or they don't want to leave the region. And so unfortunately, is it, that is unfortunate. Is it possible that people can enter into this workforce in, in construction? I mean, it's largely seasonal, isn't it? Or like, um, is there a way to work with people who want to kind of have their cake and eat it too? Like go away to work for a while and then come back home? Or is it the best time for construction is the best time to be at home when you could be outside fishing and hunting? Yeah. So, so unfortunately, the construction in Alaska is the same time as a lot of subsistence lifestyle, um, a lot of subsistence going on. So there's um, a conflict of interest. Yeah. So there's a conflict there. Mm -hmm. um, and for, for instance, you get into a trade, let's say equipment operator. That's what I was in the army. Um, you get into the trade, you got to do a, a set mine and period. You got to work your way from apprentice all the way up to, um, and up to the full fledged um, equipment operator. Okay. So, and it generally took like a three to five years okay. to get, get the hours, to get the experience. And, and during um, that time, are you making a decent wage? Are you able to like? Oh well, yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, yeah. Generally they work in seven twelves because of the short construction seasons in Alaska. Okay. Um, so they're working seven twelves. They're not they're I think uh, I could be wrong, but it's like 50% of, what a normal uh, full-fledged equipment operator or whatever trade you're in. Okay, gets. so you work your way up. But you start with a yeah. living wage to begin with. I mean, that's my understanding Correct. is that we have these economic engines, these Alaska Native corporations with uh, jobs that are sometimes not necessarily in Alaska. Um, they're away from home. They could be far away from home, um, but they're, they're good paying jobs, right? So, yes. um, but that's not how so, we necessarily make our decisions just based on money. Yeah. Yeah. And if you put in the time, you become a journeyman or whatever trade construction trade that you um, are working in. Um, you're, you're making, uh, you can work seven months out of the year and that's how much money you can make and, uh, and be fine. Um, the, the only drawback is, you have to go to school. The school's in Palmer or Fairbanks. I think there's one in Nome. Uh, the, yeah, they're my, I'm not sure. Uh, I mainly dealt with the Fairbanks and Palmer. Uh, that's 
that's where they uh, they did a lot of the schools at for different trades. Did you mention Seward? Wasn't there one in Seward? Yeah, there was one in Seward too, I believe. And uh, okay. they were talking about trying to get one out in Bethel, but they're working on that. Okay. And so I want to just make sure that I um, cover all of the um, discussions that we were having um, online. I was in the National Guard prior to going active duty, and uh -huh. I was a helicopter mechanic. Huh. So then when I went active duty in the Army, I, I changed jobs to a, the engineer field. So I became a heavy, heavy equipment operator slash crane operator. Okay. And I so kind of work, work, work my way up that way. And the Army provides that training free. Right. I was going to say, is that still like a good avenue for young people to consider to use the armed forces as a way to start a career in a trade? I mean, there's the Army, there's the Air Force. I mean, I, I know people that have done the same thing for like A&P mechanics who have come out of the Air Force here in Anchorage and gone to work. Somebody I may have dated. Yeah, yeah it, it's actually um, it's actually very viable because you okay. get real world experience. Um, not only do you learn that trade, but you get world work experience building projects all over the world. I've, I've built um, roads, bridges, and airfields and helipads all over Iraq, Afghanistan, Bosnia, Hawaii, the Arctic. You name it, I've, I've done construction in there. That's amazing. I, I have a question for you. I said I wasn't going to ask you anything that wasn't on the list that I sent you, but I am going to ask about this, and that is project management experience. That's different than being a equipment operator. I mean, people can become project managers without having gone through a trade. Is that right or no? Correct. Um, well, the, a lot of project managers um, are your college-educated engineers or right. guys like me that came up um, as I got promoted. Um, I started to run projects. Okay. I, I started start as you progress in the military. Um, they give you the same skill sets. They teach you the same stuff that project managers in the civilian will learn. So it's not a, a giant leap from the military world to the civilian world. Um, but you learn as you progress. And okay. so I, by, the time, by the time I retired, I, I was managing, you know, over 30, I think I, by the time I retired, I managed uh, like over 35 projects. Now that's a lot of projects. Yeah. So surprisingly, a lot of your tradesmen, trades people, they, um, the journeyman at the journeyman level, they actually make more than uh, me on some projects um, in the civilian world as, as a project manager. Well, that, that's incentive right there. Generally, because we're on salary and-, and Right. Uh, and when you get down to needing to make a deadline, people start working. Yeah. So you generally, especially when you're working seven twelves, um, you're working seven days a week, twelve they hours. Four a day hours of overtime every day. Yeah, I worked on the slope, and yeah. that was uh, that was some great money. I really am glad I had that opportunity. That was kind of mid college career for me. I had like the extended college program where I kept taking these time <laughs> time off to go and do other interesting yeah. things. But yeah, the the hourly people on the slope did really well. Yeah. But and the good thing about the good thing about the military also is I got free college. So I, I came out of the came, right. came out of the army with uh, three three college degrees. And um so and one in construction management, one in law enforcement and my associates. But um so it it it's a, a good segue to get free education and good education. So I wanted to ask you um, specifically what you think the native corporations can do to help their shareholders develop the skills to get into construction or other jobs on federal contracts. And we've talked about that. Um, I think at the Excel, you've mentioned that several times. Um, is there anything else that that's, that's Excel is something that a um, young person can do on their own, but what is a, what is the best practice that you've seen um, in your in your job or previous jobs for either Chalista or subsidiaries? What are some best practices that you saw for um, trying to increase the number of shareholder hires at like decent you know decent jobs where they're getting paid well? And generally, uh, the, one of the best practices I saw was um, a 
a internship program that lasted the summer and and they actually worked in that industry okay. uh, construction aviation um, admin whatever it is um, and they got that real world experience. And a lot of times your interns did that for two, three years. They graduated college. A lot of them are college students. And, and um, they graduated college and they came back to work for the corporation in whatever industry, business line that that corporation has. There's, um, like Chalista has a really good workforce development program. And uh, Chugach, out of Anchorage, they, they have an awesome um, internship program. And they invest a lot of money. So a lot, a lot of it has to do with money. Um, so investing money in, in the um, descendants or um, younger shareholders, the younger generation. So if you want to get shareholders to work for you, you, you have to put forth the financial. Um, you got you to gotta, you gotta fund it, essentially. Right. And it'll pay off in spades because the, your, your descendants will or your shareholders will come back and work for you. And um, because a lot of them have done internships with their business lines already. Okay. So it's actually a good long-term investment. So in the ones that you, um, I agree with you that that's a good long-term investment. Uh, In the two programs that you mentioned, Chalista and Chugach, did they actually place interns in um, business lines outside of Alaska or did they only place them within Alaska? Oh, no, outside Alaska, my son actually did really? an internship at Ulista in, in uh, Huntsville. In Huntsville? Yeah, so he actually works for um, Ulista in Huntsville now. You're kidding. What does he do? Yeah, he, he's uh, in the production, from, in the aviation production. Oh, that's fantastic. So, so he works for, and like, for instance, Chalista, um, I've seen Chalista and Chugach, um, business lines in Hawaii, Alabama, but speaking from Chalissa's point of view, there's, um, they got a NASA contract in, in Houston. So there's a wide variety of places you can go. Um, and they'll send interns outside of Alaska. Oh, it, it, it do all the time. Um, well, I mean, that, that's incredible. I, I think all of the ANC should do that, that have subsidiaries outside. That's, I mean, how, how else can the next generation be prepared to take over these behemoths that have these business lines that are uh, that span so many different business lines? You, you have to have people in management that have been out working in these subsidiaries yeah. on the ground, in my opinion. Yeah. And me, I, I, I strictly work DOD contracts. Okay. Oh, right. So we haven't talked about that, about the types of projects that you worked on. You got NAFAC, which is a Navy version of... Um, Army Corps engineer. Um, you got the Air Force also, um, but a lot of lot of the, lot of the people go through the Army Corps engineer now because mainly it's the Corps is just a construction management firm, lack of better terms. So they manage their projects for That's other it. services. If you think of the Corps engineers managing projects, you'll say Corps engineer project. Um, they're they're just kind of managing the construction project for whether it be the Army, the Air Force, oh. um, NAPAC, the um, Coast Guard, whatever, whatever oh. federal agency it wants them to run their projects. You mentioned quite a few um, projects that you've been on that like were in the Middle East or um, abroad, let's say. Did that require a security clearance? Correct. Um, well, being in the military, you... You already had one. Yeah, and I still actually still have mine because I only retired four years ago. Um, there's different levels of security clearance, uh, which, um, it's hard to get security clearance if you don't pay your bills or if you do drugs or you get arrested. So this is why I wanted to, I wanted to set you up with that question to have people who are maybe in their late teens, early twenties, who are trying to figure out what they want to do. And I'm not saying that they need to never have any fun in their life, but there are some things that you might choose not to do in order to protect an opportunity later. And like you said, paying your bills, what else do you need to do to be able to get a security clearance? And not do drugs. Um, even, even like in, with a legalization marijuana, it doesn't really apply to federal contractors because um, 
you still got a drug test into your job. Right. I mean, it's not it's not federally it's not legal at a federal level. So it's it it should be. And then I would assume that would you would also want to make sure that your record is clean. So no petty crimes, no speeding tickets, which makes it sound like no fun. But I think yeah. I've, I've got speeding tickets. It's just you, you got you got to live a life where you don't end up in jail. Um, see, yeah. See, you need to or, or, some your, or your habits don't lead you to fail a drug test. Um, and that's one of the big impediments of shareholder hiring, unfortunately, is um, there's a lot of people we want to hire, but they can't pass a background check or they can't pass a drug test or or they can't get on base access because they have a criminal history. So there's a wide variety of reasons why you want to. I'm glad that we got to that point in this conversation because it's so it's so cyclical. Like the problem is like a chicken and an egg thing. Uh, drug and alcohol abuse can, you know, I think one of the factors for that is poverty. I mean, honestly, and then if you're trying to help someone lift themselves out of a uh, lower socioeconomic situation, but they've already gotten into some trouble because they were maybe self-medicating with drugs and alcohol, it can hinder them, unfortunately. So one of the things that I've been thinking about um, with regards to this topic is, you know, I have you been following how all of the ANCs are setting up settlement trusts? Yes. So, you know, that's for, um, I mean, it's broad, it's, it's very broad, like what those, that funding can be used for is very broad. And one of the things I think we could potentially set aside money for, depending, I mean, each ANC is, uh, can set up its own um, trust, but one of the things we can do is we can maybe try to help young people to make decisions and have um, cleaner records when they come out of high school. So they have some of these opportunities that we're talking about where they have access to really good jobs, careers, but they might require a security clearance. And if you're not in a good place in high school and you get into some trouble, it could conceivably hinder your long-term income. So I, I, I mean, this is something that I'm just kind of thinking out loud about right now. It's something that's mm -hmm. relatively new, um, I think, for the ANCs. Not for everybody. Some of them have had them for a while now. But uh, I just think, like, in terms of uh, helping descendants to be in a good place, that maybe this is a, a way where we can use some of that money that's set aside to make sure that the kids get some help to um, treat, like, some of the situations they might be dealing with at home. Correct. And some of the biggest issues um, can, and I, some of the, like uh, the, I think the lower Yukon school district is um, King, um, teaming up with um, King's trade school in Anchorage. Oh, so they're awesome. going to send their, they're going to send their entire um, school population, junior and senior, to King's trade for six months. They're actually bought a hotel off of Spinard. They're making Wait, who's doing that? Lower Yukon um, School District. Oh, that's awesome. So they're they're getting them exposed to different trades, not only construction, there's a lot of medical trades, um, different different right. type of trades. So they'll right. go to King's um, King's Trade School, I believe it's King's Trade School is part of the Anchorage School District. So there's there's ways and means where you can address, um, hit the youth early. Right. Well, you know, so, I'm wondering, not to cut you off, but I'm wondering if this is uh, the King's Trade School, if that is the successor to a program that I participated in in my senior year in high school. I had, um, I kind of had a torturous high school experience and it did not end well. Um, I ended up coming out of uh, a school that, it there was save one and save two. Did you go to high school in Anchorage? Yeah, well, and it's similar to, I went to um, high school in Fairbanks. I graduated in Fairbanks. Um, but they had the Hutchins, Hutchinson Career Center. And yeah, Anchorage the Martin Luther King Jr. Career Center yeah. or something is what I did part of my so, class time at. So there, there's a lot of both tech back in the day, when I say right. back in the day, back in the 80s and 90s. Um, there, was a lot of, <laughs> there was a lot of both tech focus, not so much college focus. Yeah. And, um, and so it, a lot of people during that time frame 
actually learn to trade as opposed to going to college. And I think that that is what we should have as an, an option. And I think that um, my regional corporation where I serve on the board, that's one of the things that we're starting to um, increase support for is uh, um, school, you know, education, the tuition, sorry, um, the tuition for VOTEC, just as, you know, as, as well as um, two year and four year degree programs, because not everybody wants to go to college. Yeah, and not college is not made for everybody. Also, right, exactly. And I, yeah. so I, I took advantage of a, a trade school. I went to this. I think what was the predecessor to this King's Trade School? I'm going to look that up. So I did um, some sort of like business program, and it helped me to get my first full time job, so that I was able to work at the Anchorage Daily News right out of high school. I didn't go to college right away, because I had clerical experience clerical experience. It's so funny. So old fashioned, but it got me in my first job, which led to working in credit and collections and learning to see that, um, the professionals that worked around me, um, that had college degrees were the ones who made me realize that I needed to go back to school. So these, I think these web tech programs are, you know, it could be what leads to people having a career. Like you have had a career in, um, construction. I have an uncle, um, who, was a tradesman and he had a very long and healthy career. Um, he's an iron worker. Um, you know, there's people like me who do a little bit of it and then shift out and go to school. You've kind of, you've kind of done both because you said you have three degrees. Yeah. Yeah. So I've done both. Um, and, and I've seen, um, college is not for everybody and the trades is not for everybody. So, but the good thing about trades is that you're making, really 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 good money and um I'm and, glad you you don't have, that. And, and you don't you don't have college debt because yes. you're actually getting paid to go to school i think that's the perfect place to end <laughs> all right thank gonna, you for your time i'm gonna say goodbye and thank you so much for sharing all of your insight into uh this area of um i think an important area for our ANCs to be considering which is um how to help the young people who are shareholders or descendants of shareholders to get, get involved. No, you got any questions? You got my email. All right. Thanks so much. Have a good night or day. It's still daytime. Yeah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah. Almost dinner time. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.